everyone, and uh, uh, thank you for joining this morning uh, our international rounds. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Massimo Casa and uh, Professor Emiliano Botta, who together are going to discuss today how comp computational models can help us in ACSD. So, uh, Massimo and Emiliano, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And it's a great pleasure for, for me to, 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 to share with you this uh, important uh, hour. And also a great pleasure uh, to have the possibility to exchange some thoughts with my friends there. I thanks to the organizer to invite us to this important meeting. But I'm also very happy because I can share uh, with you uh, um, this topic with my friend, Professor Emiliano Vota, that is uh, the person that is running uh, our uh, 3D uh, printing and computer simulation uh, lab in our center. And uh, let's uh, say that probably our uh, title uh, is uh, uh, how computational models can help us in ACHD. Maybe we uh, could change it. Uh, how engineers can help us uh, in uh, managing our uh, patients. Why it is so important? Okay, because uh, as you know, uh, when we are managing our uh, patient will uh, try to follow them up. What is important at, at the moment we are able to, 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 to follow them using our clinical, morphological, functional markers. And this can help us in uh, uh, taking care of them, uh, taking care of the disease progression, uh, we are able using these markers uh, to more or less find the correct timing for treating them. But, uh, you know, our dream is uh, to have uh, much more sense, much more, sh uh, much sharper uh, information for this uh, uh, patient, uh, maybe some, um, some tools that can help us uh, to arrive before that, uh, the, uh, the evolution of the uh, disease. That's the reason why we started, in, let's say, five uh, years ago, more or less, oh. a, a, a collaboration with uh, the uh, Politecnico in Milan, that is the, the School of Engineers, uh, that is a, a, an important center for this specific uh, uh, aspect. Uh, we uh, created a joint uh, uh, department working together in the same structure, in the same center in uh, Policlinico San Donato. What we did, we uh, tried to put uh, all together uh, engineers, and the physician starting to be trained each other. And in that way, we started a very important collaboration that gave us the possibility to start the computational model program. And now I ask Emiliano to introduce the concept of computational modeling. Yes. So the idea is the following. Uh, at the state of the art, you have the assessment of the conditions of a patient, mostly based on clinical imaging, in various modalities, and imaging data can contribute to uh, build, let's say, the bulk of your clinical data that will then drive your decision. Uh, the motivation behind the use of computational modeling is the need to extract as much information as possible from medical imaging. And you can do this with two different goals in your mind. The first one can consist in having a more precise, quantitative, detailed snapshot of the patient that you're observing right now. So it is to support you and basically diagnosis and prognosis. 
the other goal you may pursue instead is the prediction of what would happen to the patient in a hypothetical future scenario. For instance, uh, after a given treatment to resolve a pathological condition. These two goals are different and require completely different working pipelines in terms of computational modeling. In the first case, what you need is building tools that leverage on medical imaging to post-process the data offline and extract detailed information, which can be about solid tissue deformations like for the ventricular wall, for the arterial wall, or about the fluid dynamics. This is something you can do uh, when you have a standard but reasonably powerful hardware equipment. You write your own codes to segment the images, to extract the data, and to then implement all the calculations you want to implement. The results will be a plethora of data that go from morphological to functional to biomechanical information. What you're doing in this case is basically a indirect measurement of the uh, indices or the, 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 let's say, quantities that are relevant to your problem. And as for any measurement, you will have to face some limitations that mostly are due to the spatial and temporal resolution of the clinical imaging, to the fact that you may have artifacts in the images, to the fact that if the working pipeline involves some manual operation by an operator, you may have some operator dependency and hence some variability of the outputs of your calculations depending on who worked on the processing. In the second case, so when it comes to predicting hypothetical scenarios, things become way more complex. You will have to build yourself a full computational model. In this model, can you see that the cursor of my mouse is moving it on the screen? I hope so. But as you see depicted in red, in this case, you have the 3D reconstruction of the anatomy of a thoracic aorta. This geometry, as you can see in the zoom in, is discretized into what we call finite elements. So little pieces of geometry, each one having a very simple shape. And you will need to fit this model with all those features that represent either the physical properties of the tissues involved in the problem or the way this portion of the anatomy interacts with the rest of the body. So in this case, because you want to compute the fluid dynamics of blood inside the thoracic aorta, you will need to feed the model with an input consisting oops, in uh, a waveform of flow, uh, where you would have the aortic valve. You will have to define what we call hydraulic impedances, which are resistances and compliances downstream of every outflow of the model so to account for the coupling with the vessels that are not explicitly in the model but do have an effect on what happens inside the domain of the model. And if you want to account for the distance stability of the walls, you will have to define the mechanical properties of arterial wall tissue. Also, of course, you will have to define the behavior in terms of viscosity and density of blood. You will have to tell the model whether you expect the flow to be turbulent or not. When you have your full setup, you will have to leverage on high performance computing resources that allow you for parallel computing to run a simulation and then predict the time dependency and the space dependency of whatever the variable basically with extreme space and time resolution. So in this snapshot, for instance, you can see the field of pressure. It is very important to uh, highlight that a model of this kind always requires a set of assumptions and simplifications. And you have to be careful about this because they may be impactful on your final results. So what is important? Uh, collaborating with the engineers, what is important is to, uh, to ask the uh, correct question. 
to ask a very defined question. And uh, during this period, we had the possibility to, um, to ask them uh, some uh, specific question related to uh, more detailed anatomical assessment, how we can have better assessment from uh, the anatomical point of view in terms of quality of uh, images or different tools to imaging our patients. The timing of intervention, this was an important uh, step, uh, implant stability, etc., etc. So we it started to ask them a specific question. And uh, starting from these specific questions, we had a, a specific, uh, uh, a very important uh, answer. The first question was a, a better uh, anatomic, anatomical analysis in terms of uh, quality of visualization of the anatomy of our patient. Because we can have a 3D rendering, we can have a 3D printing, both of them with some specific limit, because we may have a virtual section when you are creating a 3D rendering, a virtual measurements, but at the same time, you can lost the haptic feedback that you can get using the 3D printing, but at the same time, you are limiting in a uh, section in uh, the uh, print model because you are going to destroy it. So the first question is, uh, can we combine the cost of a 3D rendering and the 3D printing and drop the cons? So, as engineers, our answer was yes, almost. And the tool we can leverage on consists in augmented reality, which basically means representing by means of fully three-dimensional and immersive holograms the anatomy of interest. Why this solution? Because basically the only limitation that remains in this case consists in the lack of haptic feedbacks. You can virtually touch the model but you will not feel it with your touch unless you equip yourself with ad hoc gloves that are currently uh, proposed by different, let's say, companies, but that's very, let's say, uh, on the edge of research. But in turn, you will have all of the advantages of 3D rendering and 3D printing, plus some extra advantages, which is, first of all, not only the rendering if is 3D, but you have to imagine a hologram as if it was actually a physical object. You can walk around it you can even enter inside it, you can zoom it, you can have virtual measurements just by indicating landmarks with your fingers. Also, this technology is very prone to allow an easy and fast sharing of the hologram among multiple users. So each user will visualize the same hologram and whenever any user will interact with it, can perform any highlighting of a structure, will now rotate the geometry, everyone else will see the effect of this manipulation in real time. And this can happen if the multiple users are in the same room, but also if the multiple users are in completely separated places. So it opens the way towards the possibility to have, let's say, a diffuse a uh, collaborative team of experts discussing clinical cases. However, what does it require to have this technology? Well, first of all, in terms of pipeline, it will require you to segment the clinical images. Typically, you will use CT scans, but that's not mandatory. To reconstruct the 3D anatomy, as you can see in the central panel, to clean it up, as you can see in the third, panel on the right. And so far, this is something you would do anyways, especially if you need to have a 3D printed phantom of the anatomy. The extra step will consist in transforming this clean up 3D digital model into a hologram. This requires some special hardware. You will need glasses. Uh, of course, you will need a reasonably powerful workstation to work on computer graphics, basically. And in terms of software, you will need someone 
with a background on coding. Typically, it would be some C-derived coding language. And typically, you will need a dedicated uh, graphical engine, which I call a coding environment. Probably the most adopted one nowadays is Unity, which was initially conceived to design uh, computer games, actually, but it is nowadays adopted also in real science. The second question that is uh, one of the most important uh, is the tenure of intervention. Uh, let's take uh, as a, um, an example the TPVI, the, tra the uh, transcatheter pulmonary valve implantation. As you know very well, always the uh, question is uh, when we are supposed to implant the valve. Is a complete is a constantly a balance between the need to put a valve and the problems related to the bioprothesis that is going to fail at some point. Uh, uh, we have needs for need for more and more uh, surgical or transcatheter approach in our patients. So, the question, the most important question, was: Can we obtain detailed information to support the decision? So, uh, I will exemplify an answer to this question by showing you some. Uh, results from studies that do not come from our lab, although we do perform the same type of studies. Uh, and the motivation uh, underlying what I'm going to show you is the following. Uh, whenever you um, base your decisions on what you see in terms of global remodeling of a heart chamber, uh, you realize that uh, the situation has become severe when it's basically too late because the remodeling has already taken place. So you would like to have a way to detect the triggering of an adverse remodeling process before this will affect the walls of the chamber. And there are very nice studies in the literature showing that early markers can be searched for in the fluid dynamics that goes on inside the chamber of interest or inside the vessel of interest. One way you can have a very detailed description of the fluid dynamics inside the heart consists in time result phase contrast MRI, which is commonly known as 4D flow. This is a special sequence of magnetic resonance imaging that provides you with the 3D velocities of tissues inside a 3D domain over time, so over the cardiac side. Uh, the raw images per se are something that you cannot really read, very noisy, not intuitive at all, but by means of processing tool, you can obtain information like the one I'm showing you in this picture. So, you can have the flow in the pulmonary artery, both in the main pulmonary artery and the branches. You can detect the regurgitant flow to the pulmonary valve, or as in the bottom panels, you can have a quantification of the regions inside the left ventricle that are characterized by cortical structures, or you can quantify either in the arteries or in the ventricle, the kinetic energy of blood, which basically will tell you how fast blood is flowing. Now, why this information is relevant? Well, because for instance, vorticity in the pulmonary artery is a marker of hypertension. The vorticity in the ventricle can be related to the remodeling of the right ventricle as well as of the left one. Uh, the reduction in the direct flow in the, in the right ventricle, by direct flow, I mean the flow that flows in the ventricle in diastole and exits from the ventricle in systole during the same heartbeat can be linked to the level of dysfunction and future remodeling of the ventricle, for instance. As an example, uh, this is an image that I took from a very, very recent study which was published this year where the authors uh, managed to correlate in a very, very, let's say, clear way, uh, the 
uh, vorticity, so the amount of vortices inside the right ventricle, not only with the fact that the right ventricle will generically remodel, but with the specific patterns of remodeling of the left ventricle and the left one. And this, of course, will tell you, once you manage through a longitudinal study to validate these kind of findings, will uh, allow you to know well in advance what will be the future evolution of the patient that you're considering. Anyway, the, 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 this point is very really, uh, important because it gives us some new insight uh, making the decision when is the correct time to implant the valve in pulmonary position. But uh, again, uh, as you probably know, our center is much dedicated to interventional transcatheter procedures. So many of our questions are related to technical aspect of transcatheter approach for our patients. And one important question was not just related to the timing, but also an important stuff. When you are treating a patient with a pulmonary regurgitation, significant pulmonary regurgitation, what is very important to know is, is the diameter. If you have a valve that can fit the diameter of your RVOT, but at the same time, also, if we can predict the stability of your uh, valve, of your bioprothesis. It is an important question, the stability. As the question is, uh, was uh, the possibility to uh, prevent, uh, to have a response of the uh, potential stability before to put your patient on the bed, be or before to, uh, to, to do the catheterization, so uh, without uh, ballooning the patient. That was the important question. All right. And to answer this question, we implemented an ad hoc, ad hoc analysis pipeline, which consists of five steps. The first three steps are manual, and I would say they are pretty classic. You start from your CT scans, you export them from the facts of your hospital, you segment the images with either uh, let's say gold standard software or with your own one, you obtain the 3D reconstruction of the relevant anatomy, plus what we call the center line, which is the curvilinear line that ideally is always centered in the lumen of the relevant vessel or the relevant heart chamber. Uh, the subsequent two steps instead were not so classic and were implemented so to be fairly automated. The first one consists in being able to track over the cardiac cycle uh, the contour of the cross section of the main pulmonary artery uh, based on dynamic CT scans. So we used an optical flow algorithm to have basically the time dependent contour and we had multiple points on each contour uh, being, let's say, whose position became known at every time point in the images. Based on this information, by means of basically finite element model theory, we were able to reconstruct the detailed continuous displacement field of the tract of the pulmonary artery that is relevant to the implant of the transcapital valve. And here you can see represented as a color map the distribution of the magnitude of displacement. So just to give you a flavor of what you can do with such a tool, I will show you two examples. So here on the left, I'm showing you the 3D rendering of the anatomy. And again, in a color code, you see the magnitude of the displacement of the relevant tract of the anatomy. As you can see, on the two opposite sides of the wall, you have a very different behavior, which can be pretty stiff here on the right or quite deformable here on the left. This is likely because there was a patch implanted, I believe, in this patient in the early stages of his or her life. Uh, you can have a quantification of the longitudinal extent of the relevant region 
and over this longitudinal extent, three cross sections are defined a proximal, a distal one, and an intermediate one. On each of those, you can have the automated calculation of the cross section area, of the perimeter of the cross section, and of the equivalent hydraulic diameter of the cross section over time. So, based on the diameter of the uh, stent that characterizes the device you're going to implant or that you would like to implant, in this case it was 30 millimeters, you can compare this to the uh, diameter of the native vessel at the three sections. Now, a stent of this kind always uh, becomes stable if you have what we call interference. It means that the nominal diameter of the stent has to be larger than the diameter of the side of the implant, so that because of the radial expansion force, the stent will sort of push against the negative wall. Now, in this patient, you can see that this condition is fully satisfied in two sections, the uh, uh, distal and proximal one. In the central one, it's sort of borderline, but it's still okay. So this is a patient in which you will expect the implant to be stable. In the second example, I will show you a different behavior. Again, the same type of information, the distribution of wall displacement, again, an asymmetrical behavior, of the wall at the set of implants. Again, the three cross sections defined over the longitudinal extent of the set of implants. Again, the same time plot of area, perimeter, and diameter. And as you can see in this example, both the proximal cross section and the central cross section have a diameter that is way larger than the one of the stent of the device that was going to be implanted. So in this case, the implant cannot be expected to be stable. So basically you have beforehand the same type of information you would have by ballooning, but without the need, the need of contrast agents, without the need of x-rays, without the need of going basically in the cath lab. That point, uh, what is also important is not just to predict uh, uh, how the procedure we uh, how we can do the procedure, how we can uh, uh, have a better timing for our procedure, but also to prevent uh, adverse uh, events, to prevent complications. That's probably one of the most important points. And uh, following with the same example of the TPVI, you know that uh, what are the most uh, uh, worried uh, problems that we can encounter uh, during our procedures. First of all, the coronary compression, the aortic root uh, uh, distortion, the uh, problems related to the calcification. We can fragment uh, or dislocate uh, this calcification. And we have uh, also distortion of our uh, stent. So can we predict uh, this kind of uh, adverse uh, events just uh, having a CT scan done before the procedure? Question: We are shifting from the first type of goal, so having a better snapshot of the patient, to the second type, which is prediction. And I believe you will appreciate how now the working, the modeling pipeline we have to implement is way more complicated than the one I showed for question number three. Now I'm not going to the details of the entire pipeline. I just want to stress. Two things. Number one, upon reconstructing the 3D anatomy and discretizing it and cleaning it, you have a step that becomes really complex in this specific application, which is the assembly of the entire model. Why? Because all the questions that Massimo was mentioning focus on what will happen in the implantation of a percutaneous pulmonary valve. Uh, well, sorry, will happen because of what you're doing in terms of implanting the transcatheter pulmonary valve. But the uh, risks you want to predict are related to other structures, coronary arteries, uh, aortic wall, and so forth. So it means that these structures have to be included in your model, which means that the model becomes very complex and consisting of many pieces. 
The second aspect I want to stress is that because of this complexity and because of the complexity of the physics you are going to represent in the model, which includes the nonlinear mechanical behavior of the tissues, includes contact interactions between the skin and the uh, native tissues, between the balloon and the skin, and so forth. Simulations are really, really computationally expensive. So, on a part of the computing system, it takes 200 hours to have the simulation completed, and it takes another two hours to then extract the data and make them readable by the end user. So this is just an idea of what the model will include. You will have the anatomy of the RVOT of the pulmonary artery that's in red color, the anatomy of uh, the aortic root and the ascending aorta that's in CN. You will have the anatomy of the coronary artery that's in dark blue. Plus, you will have calcifications in gray. Now, of course, in the top right panel, these are the pitted outside of the anatomy, but just, just, that's just for the sake of clarity. They are really inside, of course, the vessel. And you can see three examples down here of their anatomies so that you can appreciate the intersubject variability of the anatomy which is why it is important to have patient-specific models based on pre-op CT scans. On top of that, you will have to build the computational model of the implantable device, which means a CP stand in this case. We don't, we don't care about the, the valves, so the prosthetic leaflets, plus the balloon. This is a big balloon, which is very complex because it's basically two nested balloons that will inflame into different steps the device. Now, uh, the first risk that wanted to be assessed was the risk for coronary compression. So here you can see two examples of two patients in which we computed what was going to be the distance between the wall of the coronary artery and the wall of the pulmonary artery upon inflating the balloon. In one subject, you have this distance is about four millimeters, so this is not judged at, at, as something at risk. Whereas in the other subject, the distance became submillimetric. You see 0 0.2 millimeters. So this is a subject that we would consider at risk. Okay. Now, how do you do this? Because through the simulation, you will inflate the balloon, and as you can see, by the red arrow, you have a compression in the model of the coronary artery. What is interesting is that if, if you look at what happens in the real imaging on the right, the arrow indicates the same site in the real patient. And you can tell clearly that the cross the contrast agent at some point stops flowing because of the presence of the balloon flowing into the coronary artery. We applied the set of modeling uh, to about a dozen patients so far, and because we wanted to test the reliability of the model, we simulated the balloon blinded the actual uh, outcome of the ballooning in the real patients. So according to our simulations, we had four patients, number seven, eight, 11, and 13, where the distance between the pulmonary uh, artery and the coronary artery became so small that it was risk of compressing the uh, coronary artery. And what is interesting is that no one of the other patients uh, suffered from this risk in the real procedure. Out of the four patients we identified, three of them actually uh, suffered from this complication during ballooning, so uh, were sent to surgery. The fourth one was not even treated because suffered from endocarditis. So basically, we only had true positives, uh, we only had uh, true negatives, and we just have a doubt on the station number eight, which we will never verify. So far, so good. So this tells us about the reliability of the model, which is very important. Something, of course, is mandatory. Uh, 
as I said, you can have the, an extremely space resource and time resource of any variable you can imagine from this model. This includes, in our case, stresses on the wall of the aortic roots. This is the color map on the right. These stresses on the wall of the pulmonary artery. This is on the left. Or the level of dislocation and stresses on the calcifications, which can be used as a surrogate information of the chance for breaking calcium deposits, calcium deposits, basically. Last but not least, you can predict the distortion of the state. Uh, so you can tell whether you will have a sort of divergent, convergent configuration, so an narrowing in the central section of the skin, or as in the third case down here, a sort of tapering profile of the skin upon implantation. Again, uh, this may sound not so relevant, maybe, but from the modeling perspective, it is very relevant because this is another result you can compare versus a ground truth data, which is the intraprocedural fluoroscopic imaging. So to tell what is the mismatch in terms of local diameters of the stent between reality and the model. So again, this is a way to test the reliability of your model. And, uh, as we are running short of time, let's uh, shift to the last question. That is an important uh, uh, point because uh, we were able to predict something before uh, to the uh, transcatheter pulmonary valve implantation, but also we need to know what is going to happen uh, before to do it. Uh, also, in other situations, this is a, a clear example with some patient treated in our uh, cat lab related to the coartation of the aorta with different uh, coartation uh, morphology with different severity. And the question, the most important question was, uh, we uh, forecast the post tenting aorta biomechanics. So are we able to give us uh, information of what is going to happen when we are going to inflate our balloon with the stent? So again, it's a matter of predicting a hypothetical post-intervention scenario. So what you see on the left is an animation showing you the virtual stenting of the quartic region of a patient. Again, we had to conceive an ad hoc uh, pipeline to model the situation. This is again very important. Every time you have a specific question, a specific clinical scenario, they mark the peculiarities that have to be accounted for. In this case, I want to stress two aspects. Number one, because you have a very narrow section that will be stretched a lot circumferentially by the stenting, this may lead to problems in terms of simulation. So you have to conceive some trick, basically, to tackle to cope with this potential problem. Number two, if you want to compare the post-stenting biomechanics versus the pre-stenting one, you need to be able to have information on the pressure levels uh, distally and proximally with respect to the stented section before and after stenting. And in this case, of course, we have only the pre-op data. So based on the literature, we built ourselves uh, against some schemes to shift and, and dilate pressure curves so to have a good approximation of reality. So again, testing the reliability of the model, key concepts. So here I'm showing you the three patients with the ground truth data and along with the corresponding computed uh, configuration of the stent upon inflation of the balloon and elastic recoil. And you can see that there is a very, very good agreement in terms of local diameters. Second, once you do that, you can, uh, oh, well, you can extract actually the stresses acting on the wall of the aorta, which is an information that should tell you if there is any overstressing, which could cause a damage or an adverse remodeling process in the tissue. And as an engineer, 
because I have no clinical experience uh, from these kind of problems, I expect that patient number two to be the one with the highest stresses by far because the narrow section was so narrower as compared to the other ones. But that didn't occur. As you can see, actually, you have uh, worse stress concentrations in patient three as compared to patient two. But correctly, Massimo pointed out that based on his experience, this result had to be expected because whenever you have a more severe narrowing of the section, it means that the tissue just distally uh, and proximally as compared to that section is not straight, but has to cover a, a, a curved profile, which means you have extra tissue available to then cover the dilated. Uh, profile of the section. So you don't really have to stretch, you just have to reorient and reposition the tissue. So this is consistent. And again, if you have, if you want to focus on different regions for any reason, you can do that and you can have your statistics. statistics. And again, uh, I want to again highlight the difference between patient two and patient three, which was so unexpected to me. Uh, 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 initially, but then was not expected, unexpected at all to Massimo. So, I would like to conclude by summarizing in actually what we show you so far. So, can computer modeling help you in treating other congenital heart diseases? Yes, uh, and it can, uh, not maybe always, but in many scenarios. But there is a but, very important one. You will need something. First of all, you will need proper equipment. It means computing facilities. It means software that can be commercial or in PPT very expensive or in-house software that you will build with your engineers. If you want to go for augmented reality, you will need glasses for cameras. You will need proper competencies in terms of technical skills, in terms of modeling capabilities. It means that it doesn't matter what, you will need engineering, you will need people, experts in computer science and things like that. You will need physicians, so either yourself or your collaborators, available to extract extra data as compared to your usual uh, last but not least, uh, as a modelist, I never fully trust models, and neither should you do it. In this process, it is crucial that when building the models, when conceiving the working pipeline, when uh, setting the clinical questions, when analyzing the, re the reliability of your models, engineers and physicians must interact. You always have to see the two sides of the story. And all in all, what you will need is a bad investment, at least at the beginning. An investment in terms of money. In terms of time, you will have a learning period. You will need extra time for the extra data and so forth. But most important, you will need to invest in a change problem in terms of mindset and uh, the way you tackle your problems because clinicians will have to learn how to interact with engineers and the other way around. And that's not so true. Uh, with this, we are done, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent talk and uh, and amazing review of uh, 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 what we can do with technology. So, if anybody has any questions, just feel free to either unmute your microphones, uh, ask the questions directly, or um, ask the que or just type them on the chat. I I will just. Yeah, read the question. So I have one question that came came to my head as you were talking. So the the models are really helpful and in, and really can't 
guide your interventions. But as you said in your in your take home message, it's quite time consuming. And uh, my question to you is, how often do you do this in the, in the in your patients? Do you do this for every single PDR, or do you do uh, or every single coarctation? Or how did you choose which patient you model, or you model all of them? No, we are not modeling all of these patients. Uh, there are uh, uh, two tracks because uh, uh, in, uh, we are not uh, uh, already able to do that for all the patient because it is uh, expensive. Uh, we need the time to do that. Uh, uh, also, we need to validate all the, the simulation we are uh, doing. So we try to, uh, to, to check and to do that for more complex cases, for the most challenging cases, where after the uh, CT scan or the other imaging, we feel that uh, uh, there are some tricky uh, answers that we need before to put the patient on the bed. And uh, um, on the table, and uh, I think uh, uh, this is an important point. The other track is the study of the single uh, question we ask our engineers at a patient that we decide to put in the track of the research pipeline. Uh, so uh, I don't know when we'll be uh, we will be able to do that in a, a routine basis for all the patients. What do you think, Emilian? It really depends on the specific question. So uh, what I wanted to stress at the beginning is that as far as, for instance, questions one, two, and three are concerned, the tools that uh, we implemented, of course, took some time for their implementation, for their testing. But once they are ready, the extra time they require in terms of analyzing the patient is not that much. It's less than half an hour, and typically it's something automated, which means that you just press a button, then you go do something, something else, which can be you drink a coffee, you have a discussion with colleagues, you visit a patient, then you come back, and you have the data available right away. So it's something affordable. Uh, when it comes to get actually modeling hypothetical scenarios, uh, Right now, we have two studies uh, that are being carried out uh, by the people in the lab and also by master students from Polytechnico, which are exactly devoted to understanding uh, how much we can simplify the model without an excessive loss in terms of reliability. Uh, and, and while on the other hand, having uh, let's say, a more time efficient modeling process. So uh, I hope that at the end of those studies, I will be able to give you a precise answer. But I think that uh, even in my wildest dreams, the process will be something in terms of uh, you feed the model today and you have the answer tomorrow. So it's something that, of course, you could not use uh, when you have urgent cases, but it would become suitable whenever you would have cases that you plan beforehand. The, okay, so so there's a question in the chat. David, do you want to ask the question? I'm not sure whether I get the three questions in one. So yes, um, sorry. Here's David, a clinical fellow. So first of all, thank you for this talk. I'm. I'm I'm uh, quite ignorant in the topic, but uh, it was really interesting. And I was wondering, especially in the models that uh, you used to predict outcomes, as you have been proving that uh, they are reliable, does this model um, like use the data that you have been um, using with this initial patient so that you improve the model itself? And I don't know if this is what they what it's called like machine learning or deep learning when oh, when the model no. itself it gets improving. And then is this something like apart from developing the model, um, like giving the model the 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 ability to to improve? Is this something like of a greater complexity, or or is this something that you can just implement as engineers, of course? 
Okay, so this is actually a very, very interesting question. So the models I showed you today are based uh, on basically solving the mathematical equations that describe the physics of the real system. So this is not artificial intelligence, it's not machine learning. Uh, those techniques, uh, in most cases, completely ignore the physics simply because uh, this, those methods are trained on a plethora of different cases. Uh, they sort of learn how to optimally imitate what they saw before, okay? But they don't know why the outcome is that way, etc. Uh, so this is something you, you implement typically with commercial uh, software packages, quite expensive ones, uh, although you have some, some free ones out there, uh, we typically don't use them because they are not as efficient. Um, some information that you use to feed the model is patient specific, so typically the anatomy of the relevant site is based on images, um, Pressure levels, flow rates, things like that can be measured also in a patient specific fashion. There are things that cannot be patient specific. In the best case scenario, you can try to have an estimate. Uh, and by this, I am alluding to, for instance, the thickness of the wall of the vessels. There's no way you will be able to measure that from images. And I'm alluding to the mechanical properties of the tissues, which you will not be able to measure uh, if not by using quite cumbersome, let's say, approaches, which still are based on modeling anyways. Uh, so uh, it, it's a matter of uh, basically in the initial phase of the development of the models identifying, let's say, the best combination of standard, standard parameters that allow you to capture the behavior of as many patients as possible. That's it uh, for these specific features. But nowadays, there, there is a lot of hype on the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques to bypass the need for uh, simulations especially when it comes to fluid dynamics. There is uh, a lot of very interesting research nowadays. It's been developed probably in the last two years, no longer than that, but it's very promising. So I look forward to see the developments in that, in that area. So very nice question, thank you. So I have a, a, another another question, or a couple of questions in one. So, so in terms of the, you, you you need imaging to to see first what uh, uh, the problem the patient has. What is the best imaging modality in your experience to predict the good model, MRI, MRI or, or CT? So that's one question. Second is when coming to do a patient. So from beginning to the end, how much is the cost of uh, modeling the patient. So, so Maximo said that it's quite costly to do it for every single patient. Do you have a, a, an idea of a, a rough idea of what would be the cost per patient of each model? I know that depends on what you have to do, but rough idea. Would you like to answer for the imaging part, Maximo? Yes, for the imaging part, I believe in my experience, probably, um, talking about uh, quartations or TPVI, the best images you can get uh, are from um, using the CT scan. That's the reason. Uh, that's the reason why we do uh, always for our patient a, a CT scan. And maybe uh, Emiliano, you can explain why, from technical uh, point of view. Technical set point, CT scan is provided with really optimal trade-off between the state clarity of the images, so the contrast between tissues that are next to each other, because with a very, very small difference in density of the tissue, you have a pretty high difference in terms of signal in the image. And at the same time, you have excellent uh, space resolution. 
drawback, of course, is X-rays and the fact that in many cases that image is static. Um, for instance, when it comes to analyzing heart valves, in my experience, I like to use 3D ultrasound, especially for atrioventricular valves, actually, 3D ultrasound or MRI. Uh, if it was to me, I would use that as a gold standard. I think that the real answer is uh, you would like, first of all, to check if you can leverage on the imaging that is acquired by default on your patients for that type of procedure. So if CT scans are planned anyways, why not using them? Uh, if you find yourself in the position of needing CT scans just for the sake of modeling, then I believe that it's mandatory to at least try use that a different modality without x-rays. Concerning um, expenses, uh, I think that the range is really, really broad. And again, it depends on the specific questions you pose. Uh, in terms of hardware equipment, uh, we spent from a standard laptop. So let's say with $1,000, you're, you're ready to go to a high performance computing system, which means that you will invest probably $10,000 and then you will need some computing center available to host your computing capability and to manage it for the maintenance, which will imply some annual fee of some kind. In terms of software, again, the range is huge. Uh, so as far as the first three questions were concerned, that, that's all in-house software. So if you're really good at coding, you do that basically for free. Uh, it, it, the cost you pay is the cost of the man hours of where it is uh, considering and implementing the code. Uh, if you run simulations like the ones that I showed you, then typically you will use a commercial software in that case, it really depends a lot. Uh, you have software houses that provide you with excellent products, like, for instance, LS Dyna. Uh, if you're an academic institution or a non profit institution, it will cost you about $1,000 a year. Uh, if you use Abacus, which is probably the gold standard in terms of structural mechanics, uh, again, if you are, say, a private institution, uh, you will easily pay up to 30, 50K a year for the license. So there is no one fits all answer to your question. It really depends on the type of your institution, on, on, on the type of analysis you want to run, and based on that, you will have an idea of the budget you need. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a, a, a wide variety that you, you want to achieve. So unfortunately, there is a time to, to finish, so it's already 9 a.m. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for an excellent talk and excellent review of what we can achieve with the right technology and uh, where the future should go. And uh, to the attendees, thank you for joining us today and see you here in a couple of weeks. So good morning, good uh, afternoon, good evening, whatever you're in the world. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.